Okay, it's Monday, but at least you won't have a quiz for the next 10 minutes while you're watching CNN Student News. I'm Carl Azus. First up, they did it. That $700 billion bailout we've been talking about is approved. On Friday, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the controversial measure, and President Bush signed it into law less than two hours later. It includes a lot of the provisions we mentioned last week, like tax breaks for individuals and businesses, committees to oversee how the bailout is run, and protection for bank deposits. Jessica Yellen details how the deal was done. For Democratic leaders, an agonizing week ended with a laugh. The first bill fell 12 votes short and sent the stock market tumbling. An updated version passed easily, with 33 new Democrats and 26 Republicans voting yes. Some say that vote puts their political future in jeopardy. I'm voting I today, and it may be politically damaging. And the sky may fall tomorrow, but it'll fall upon my head. It won't fall upon anyone else. All were under pressure from constituents. I talked to, uh, to workers who are worried about losing their jobs. What they're saying to me is, Congressman, every day when I go to my portfolio, I'm seeing that, you know, for my pension or whatever, I'm seeing that my money is, is leaving. From business leaders. So that was coming from CEOs. It was coming from bank presidents. I think I've talked to more bank presidents in 10 days than I've talked to in 16 years. And from intense lobbying by President Bush and Senator McCain targeting Republicans and Senator Obama, who was dialing Democrats all week. There were a number of uh, uh, members of Congress who had voted no that I talked to. He called me at my home on Tuesday night. They insisted the bill is not a Wall Street bailout, but a Main Street rescue. Still many were unconvinced and accused both Democratic and Republican leaders of fear-mongering. Wall Street wants the $700 billion so bad they can taste it. To get it, they need two things. First, you create panic. Then you block alternatives. And then you herd the stampeding cattle toward passing a bad bill. Henry Paulson set, set this up. I mean, really. I mean, coming over on a Thursday night and saying the world's going to collapse, then going out to the public and saying if Congress doesn't pass this in three days, you know, the world economy crashes. Congress is really easy to stampede when they're up for election. Before Minority Leader John Boehner voted for this bill, he said the U.S. is going to need not just this legislation, but God's help to get through this financial crisis. More evidence that even those who supported the bill didn't like it. Jessica Yellen, CNN, Capitol Hill. Meanwhile, over in Europe, the leaders of France, Germany, Italy, and Britain are working to make sure their banking systems remain stable. The heads of state got together over the weekend to discuss how the current U.S. financial crisis is affecting other markets around the world. The European leaders vowed to support their country's banks, but they didn't offer many specifics. Time for the shout out. London's well-known theater district is often referred to by what name? Is it Seville Row, Piccadilly Circus, West End, or Buckingham Palace? You've got three seconds. Go! <laughs> Head to Theaterland in the West End if you're going to see a show in London. That's your answer, and that's your shout-out. When times are tight economically, many people might spend their money differently. Some cut back on spending altogether. Maybe you're one of them. How does that affect an industry, though, like theater, one that depends on investors financing these performances and audiences paying to see them? Sasha Harriman looks at how current financial struggles could have an impact on London's West End. <laughs> Rehearsals for a brand new musical in London's Theatreland premiering next month. Despite the global financial downturn, the show must go on. We're in a tough economic climate. Um, it's expensive to go to the theatre. And people are having to think about what their ch entertainment choices are. And all I can hope is, is that, that people will... People who love the theatre will still come to the theatre. Especially now we're getting shows that have got £50, £60 tickets. I mean, that is a lot of money to shell out on a, you know, on a, a, a night out at the theatre. 
if, if you're not guaranteed a good time. Last year, the figures were actually really good. There were record sales for theatre shows here in London, with more than 13.5 million theatre tickets sold. And that brought in a ticket revenue of more than $840 million. Who cares about love? Who cares about hope? They do. But October can be a make-or-break month as new shows are put on for the new season, and producers are having to work extra hard to get money up front to simply get the shows on stage. Obviously, in this economic climate, even very, very wealthy people are having to think very seriously about where they put their money. So raising money for the show has been extremely difficult. Now for her show Imagine This, a musical set in the Warsaw Ghetto, she's waiting to see if she can make good that investment and get the audiences in. There's also concern at the top end of the artistic market. The thing about running an opera house is you're making commitments for years to come because we're already booking stars and guests for you know, the 12, 13 season. Um, and uh, what you've got to look is very carefully at the money that you're spending, uh, making sure that you're doing you know, all the right things and you're not being daft in terms of your expenditures. But some observers say the industry is traditionally robust. Theatre is one of the last things that, that actually people cut back on in a recession because it cheers you up, it's a treat, and so maybe you'll, you'll cut down on your everyday uh, spend, but your special occasion spend will, will perhaps stay the same. That's what these performers will be relying on. <laughs> Sasha Herriman, CNN, London. Thirteen years to the day after O.J. Simpson was found not guilty of killing his ex-wife and her friend, the former football superstar seen here on the left was convicted of armed robbery and kidnapping in a separate case involving sports memorabilia. The judge did not allow anyone to mention the controversial murder trial of 1995 but it still was an undercurrent in this case. Simpson could spend the rest of his life in prison. A word to the wise, entrepreneur, a person who starts and runs his or her own business. Imagine trying to get a job when your age is still in single digits. Most people probably wouldn't take you very seriously, and that's what happened to a nine-year-old in Florida. So instead, she decided to start her own business and based her product on her pet. Shawnee Muhammad of affiliate WCJB in Gainesville introduces us to this underage entrepreneur. Mine people can eat. By most accounts, Sammy Seneschal is a typical nine-year-old. She likes math and loves to play with her dog. My baby. My little baby Lucky. But don't let that fool you. She's an entrepreneur who knew that if she wanted something to happen, she would have to do it herself. I wanted to make money. With the help of her mother, Stephanie Seneschal, Sammy started Sammy's Dog Treats. In May, it's an all-natural dog treat made from ingredients humans can eat. I suggest I eat it. It's for dogs, but you can eat it. It's natural. In her kitchen, she experiments with a new flavor to add to her already three-flavor treat line. Today, it's pumpkin. It's to Halloween, so holiday things. Stephanie calls herself a mompreneur who runs her own pet sitting service. Came up with the idea for Sammy to sell the treats after her daughter tried unsuccessfully to offer a pet walking service. She said, Mom, you know what? I don't know what to do. I want to make my own money. Can you help me? Sammy mixes, rolls, and cuts each batch by hand. But before each treat makes it out the door, it must get the paw's approval from her trusty taster, Lucky. And he has a foolproof way of grading the treats. If he likes them... He will go and he will eat it fast and then he will come back like, is that all I get? Come on. And if he doesn't... Hide it somewhere and he will be like... Do you got something else? <laughs> the business still has plenty of room to grow. But if you ask, lucky, the business is right where it needs to be. Okay, and before we go, another four-legged friend is right where he needs to be. But it took quite a journey for Max to get there. He disappeared into the woods after he and his owner, Bill, were in a car accident. The thing is, the wreck happened in a different state. Incredibly, the tenacious terrier found his way home... Bill doesn't know, doesn't care how Max did it. He's just happy to have his friend back. And that is the end of today's journey for us. We'll see you again tomorrow. For CNN Student News, I'm Carl Azus.